This video was made possible thanks to your support on Patreon. Subscribe on Patreon for early access to videos and additional content. Welcome to episode 2 of Cold Case Detectives Too Close to Home, a monthly Patreon-sponsored series where we select five Patreon supporters at random and examine cases featuring their hometown. If you'd like to see your hometown featured, you can check out our Patreon linked below. And now let's dive into the stories that haunt the streets of your hometowns. The mysteries that strike too close to home. Pamela Jean Dunn. Our first case for this month's Too Close to Home episode comes from our patron Miranda Mack, who chose the city of Watertown, South Dakota. Nestled between Pelican Lake and Lake Campesca, Watertown is home to around 22,000 residents, and its most notable unsolved case is the disappearance of 38-year-old Pamela Jean Dunn. Pamela was last seen at around 6pm on December 9th, 2001, when she dropped her mother off at her home in Watertown. Nothing seemed amiss, and neither party could have predicted what would later unfold. Two hours later, Pamela's mother called her and found out that her daughter's ex-boyfriend, a man named David Asmussen, was in her house. The couple had a turbulent relationship, and even after their breakup, David continued to exhibit unstable behaviours. According to the Charlie Project, Pamela had an order of protection against her ex-partner, which she had filed shortly after she began to date other men. This order was meant to prohibit David from contacting the 38-year-old and stop him from harassing and abusing her. However, after it was implemented, David continued to call and hassle Pamela. He called her 17 times in less than two weeks and left at least three messages on her answering machine in which he violently threatened her. Pamela's mother was, of course, concerned. She phoned her daughter again at 11 p.m. and Pamela told her that David had called her and that she was upset and shaken from the interaction. This was the last time that any of the 38-year-old's friends and family heard from Pamela. The following day, on December 10th, Pamela failed to show up to work. It was uncharacteristic of her to simply not turn up without giving notice of her absence, and so concerned friends went to her house. Pamela's car was in the drive, and her house was locked. Her keys and handbag were on a table inside, but there was no sign of the young woman herself. When authorities discovered that Pamela had had a volatile relationship with her ex, David, they immediately grew suspicious, suspecting that he was somehow involved in her disappearance. David admitted that he had been inside her house on the day of the 38-year-old's disappearance, making it likely that he was the last person to see her alive. However, David would admit nothing more. Authorities charged him with stalking Pamela, and he was successfully convicted and sentenced to 40 years in prison. While he did attempt to appeal his conviction, it was ultimately upheld. On the same day that David found out that his appeal was unsuccessful, he was also charged with kidnapping Pamela. The prosecution accused him of kidnapping her to facilitate aggravated assault or stalking, and with the intention of terrorizing her. The police told media outlets that they'd decided to bring these charges against David because they had discovered new evidence, but it was never publicly established what this evidence was. David was convicted in 2006 of kidnapping and sentenced to life in prison. From here, things in Pamela's case grew quiet for over a decade until authorities received a tip in 2017 that told them to look for the 38-year-old's body in a well on an abandoned farm site. The rural property is located about 20 miles east of Watertown in a town named Altamont and has been empty since the mid-1980s. It is reportedly still owned by someone living in Colorado. 
Special Agent Cam Corey of the South Dakota Division of Criminal Investigation told news outlets that both the Sioux Falls Fire Rescue and Watertown Fire Rescue personnel had entered the well, but were never able to reach the bottom. In this 2017 exploration of the property, human hair was found in the well, but it could not be identified as the sample was too degraded for DNA typing. Corey added that he believed the tip had been called in by a local resident who knew that David Asmussen frequented the area and knew it well. He would often harvest firewood in the area and had family who lived nearby. He was reportedly seen in the area on the morning after Pamela's disappearance. In November of 2020, authorities attempted to search the well once more. This time they came prepared, using an excavator and a payloader to make sure they could reach the bottom of the well and thoroughly explore the area. The well went down about 21 feet and the crew dug down 29. At between 25 and 29 feet deep, remains were found. Investigators hoped that this would be the break they needed to finally close the case as they sent the evidence off to be tested. However, their hope was short-lived. Less than a month later, it was revealed that the remains were not Pamela's. In fact, they weren't even human. Most likely they belonged to a young hoofed animal, like a deer or cow. Pamela's case is still open and unsolved. Authorities have promised to keep investigating any new leads that come their way. Without a body, they cannot press further charges against David Asmussen. According to the Charlie Project, it is possible that Pamela fled to Florida after her encounter with her ex-boyfriend, but authorities strongly believe that she became a victim of foul play, and David is still the most compelling suspect in her case. If you have any information about the disappearance of Pamela Dunn, you can contact the Watertown PD on 605-882-6210. Vicky Glass. Whitby, in the county of North Yorkshire, England, was chosen by our patron, Andrea. A cosy historical seaside town, Whitby is more well known for being the backdrop of Bram Stoker's famous novel, Dracula, than for its grisly crime. However, on Whitby's doorstep is the North York Moors National Park, a sprawling, lush green landscape filled with beautiful flora and glassy waters. Upon first glance, you wouldn't think that this would be the setting for one of England's most chilling murders. On September 24th in the year 2000, 21-year-old Vicky Glass went missing after a night out. She was last seen around 4 a.m. when she was dropped off by a taxi outside of the Shipmate, a local pub in Union Street, Middlesbrough. According to further reports, Vicky was apparently seen one more time leaving a house with an unidentified man on Prince's Road. Vicky was a troubled young woman. Although she had a happy and stable upbringing, her life spiraled out of control when she fell in with the wrong crowd at school and began to abuse drugs. It wasn't long before her overpowering heroin addiction caused her to turn to sex work so she could fund her habit. By all accounts, Vicky's lifestyle was dangerous. Six weeks after her disappearance, on November 3rd of the year 2000, Vicky's naked and disfigured body was discovered by a dog walker who had taken an isolated path in the North York Moors National Park. The 21-year-old had been dumped in a stream and, according to experts, her body had been there for several weeks. During the investigation, hundreds of people were interviewed and thousands of statements were taken. At one point, a Grimsby lorry driver was arrested in connection with Vicky's case, but was quickly released without charge. Another man, a farmer, was questioned in 2002, but he also appears to have been ruled out. Vicky's clothing and possessions have never been recovered in the years since her passing. Her case is potentially linked to the slayings of two other young women, Donna Marie Keogh and Rachel Wilson. Donna was 17 years old when she vanished on April 19th, 1998. At that time, Donna had been living with her cousins in a block of flats in the Middlesbrough Town Centre and had left at around 11 p.m. that night. Several people saw her after she left the home, but she never returned to the flat later and was never seen again. 
Rachel was just 19 years old when she was last seen on May 21st of 2002, where CCTV cameras showed her alone on the Southfield Road in Middlesbrough at around 3.30 a.m. Her final movements are unknown. Like Vicky, Rachel was also involved in sex work and drugs. Her body was found in June of 2012, covered by undergrowth in a shallow ditch at Newham Hall Farm Estate near Newham. The cause of death could not be established, and she was found without clothing or possessions. In 2020, a 61-year-old man was charged with her murder and is set to face trial in May of this year. He does not appear to be linked with Vicky's case or Donna's case at this time. In 2019, authorities appealed to the public for help, but so far, Vicky's case continues to go unsolved. Anyone with information on her case, or the cases of Donna Keogh or Rachel Wilson, can call Crime Stoppers at 0800 555 one. Barbara Knave. Our next case comes from the city of Sumter, South Carolina, which was chosen by our Patreon, The Requiem 78. Sumter is a modest city of around 40,000 people and is steeped in heritage and history. It is perhaps most notable and celebrated for being the hometown of a number of hugely important figures in the civil rights movement including Charlotta Bass, a civil rights activist who became the first African-American woman nominated for vice president in 1952, and Dr. Mary Bethune, an educator and civil rights activist who served as an advisor to several US presidents and founded the Bethune-Cookman University, among other things. But like all cities on this list, Sumter is home to several eerie mysteries. On February 4th, 2017, Barbara Knave celebrated her 80th birthday with her son and his family in Savannah, Georgia. Barbara might have been elderly, but to all those who knew her, she was vivacious and full of life. Friends described her as feisty and adventurous. A free-spirited, well-traveled woman, Barbara had raised her two children in Spain and was a grandmother to eight. She was also incredibly intelligent and accomplished. She was working on her second doctorate, choosing to focus on women's studies, and taught English to employees from overseas at Continental Tire. She was also a volunteer with the Red Cross, was interested in art, and was a user of social media. She had previously spent time breeding, training, and showing dogs. Despite her age, she was physically fit and mentally sharp. Her only ailment was that she suffered with hearing loss, although at some point she'd been fitted with a cochlear implant. Upon returning home from visiting her son, Barbara emailed one of her friends and spoke with a contractor as she was making some adjustments to her red painted home, which sat on the outskirts of Sumter. Her property consisted of about 20 acres of land and was surrounded by woods in which she regularly walked her dogs. Barbara was last heard from on February 9th, which is when she stopped responding to her emails. A neighbor claimed to see the 80-year-old head into the woods for a walk. However, she had left her dogs behind. Barbara was never seen or heard from again. Barbara's friend, Kathleen, grew concerned when she didn't receive any further emails from the elderly woman. She contacted her son, who confirmed that Barbara wasn't still in Georgia with him before she headed over to the red-painted home on February the 13th. Upon arriving, Kathleen was surprised to find the front door open. Barbara's handbag was still inside, along with her cash and credit cards. Her dogs were still in the home. Two of the three appeared very hungry and malnourished, while the third had sadly died. However, it was noted that the animal was extremely ill before Barbara vanished. Nothing in the house seemed out of place or disturbed, and there were no signs of forced entry. According to friends and family, it was unusual for the 80-year-old to leave her handbag behind if she was going out. She reportedly only ever did this if she was taking the dogs for a walk. Barbara's car, a Jeep, was still in the driveway. The windows had been rolled halfway down. However, there were no tire tracks on the dirt road leading up to the house, suggesting to loved ones and law enforcement that the car had not moved in several days. 
Given how capable Barbara was, even in her old age, friends and family thought the sudden disappearance was disturbing and suspicious. According to Captain Robert Burrish of the South Carolina Sheriff's Office, the 80-year-old's large property was thoroughly examined. Officers on foot carefully combed through the brush while divers searched the swamps. Eventually, helicopters, officers on horseback, and ATVs were all utilized. Yet, no signs of Barbara were found. Cadaver dogs alerted authorities to the swamp, but when it was drained, they found only a deer carcass. Friends and family were given polygraph tests, but everybody passed. Although authorities continue to look for leads, very few tips are trickling in from the public. Barbara's friends continue to visit the house. In 2019, Barbara's group of friends held a tribute for her at a local restaurant. Shortly after the elderly woman's disappearance, Kathleen bought her old car, a Chevrolet Tracker, from Barbara's son. She restored it to perfect condition and began entering it in car shows. While there, the friends hand out flyers and spread the word about the disappearance. They also continue to meet up and exchange information with each other and law enforcement. They routinely return to neighbors and locals to see if anyone remembers anything new. In 2018, they discovered that another Continental Tire employee had gone missing in 2017, but authorities have failed to find a link between the two. Theories in Barbara's case are few and far between. Law enforcement have speculated that she'd fallen into the swamp and was eaten by an alligator, while loved ones have theorized that, given her age, she may be dead, although they can't understand why. She was of sound mind, in good condition physically, and had no issues that would lead her to forget how to get home. Online sleuths have speculated that perhaps somebody poisoned Barbara's dog and she went to confront them. This situation could have then escalated. Others have theorized that perhaps during her walk, she tripped and fell and succumbed to the elements. Friends of the elderly woman have said that she didn't have a mobile phone due to her hearing issues, so she would have been unable to contact anyone for help. Barbara's bank accounts have never been touched in the years since she vanished. Captain Burrish noted that, as he had a pilot's license, he sometimes took a plane over the area to see if he could spot her. So far, he has not been successful in getting answers for friends and family. The case is still open and remains unsolved. If you have any information about the whereabouts of Barbara Nave, you can contact the Sumter County Sheriff's Office on 803 Four three six two zero zero zero. Samuel Gidera. Our penultimate case this month comes from our patron David Wilson, who chose the area of Sidcup in London as the basis for our investigations. Across the course of our investigations, we stumbled upon one of the UK's most horrific unsolved cases less than 30 minutes away on a street named Bailey Place in Sydenham, London. On February 12th of 2011, 24-year-old Samuel Gadera spent his day watching football with his friends. A well-liked and clever young man, Samuel was a student at the University of Greenwich where he studied history and politics. He also had a passion for teaching and hoped to eventually make this his job. His parents described him as caring and family oriented. On that night of February 12th, Samuel left his friends at around 9.17 p.m. so he could meet his girlfriend. He arrived at Penge East Station at 9.30 p.m. CCTV from a local convenience store showed Samuel around 10 to 20 minutes before he was attacked. He was carrying a distinct bright pink T-Mobile carrier bag and nothing seemed amiss. He was last seen on CCTV at 9.38 p.m. at a bus stop opposite Bailey Place. It is unknown what exactly happened after this, but the aftermath leaves no room for doubt. Samuel was killed in what police believe was a street robbery gone wrong. The 24-year-old was stabbed in the heart and his wallet was taken. He was found lying on the street by a passerby who stopped and attempted to revive him, initially believing that he'd been hit by a car. He was not breathing when he was found 
and was taken to King's College Hospital where he died less than an hour later at 10.55 p.m. Moments before he was stabbed at 9.48 p.m., an unknown phone number was entered into Samuel's phone. The number 0740-477-6433 was traced by police as none of Samuel's loved ones recognized it. It was traced to a Leica pay-as-you-go SIM card that had not been activated. Upon releasing this information to the public, authorities added that they wished to speak to anyone with a similar number, as this could have been a misdial. The odd phone number also led police to theorize that perhaps the perpetrator, or perpetrators, stopped Samuel under the guise of needing to borrow his phone. To add to the tragedy of the whole situation, authorities also noted that the 24-year-old had attempted to dial emergency services after being stabbed, but had accidentally dialed 9999, and the call had obviously not connected. Over the course of their investigation, law enforcement has spoken with 900 witnesses, explored over 1,000 leads, and searched through hundreds of hours of CCTV. Although little is publicly known about the investigation, there have been several arrests in Samuel's case. An article from the BBC states that in June of 2011, two men aged 28 and 39 were arrested on suspicion of murder. They were ultimately bailed, and no further action against them was taken. A third man, aged 18, was arrested shortly after this, but it appears that no charges were brought against him either. That same year, authorities released a video on YouTube which showed CCTV of around 32 people that they wanted to speak with and rule out. A later article in 2017 stated that the majority of witnesses had been identified and spoken to. In total, five arrests have been made in Samuel's case, but no charges have ever been brought. One man reportedly confessed to a friend that he was the culprit, but law enforcement managed to debunk this claim. The man apparently confessed to boost his own image. Another strange thing to note is that in March of 2011, the BBC wrote and published an article which claimed that the police were looking to speak with an anonymous man who called in with information on the incident after seeing the case featured on the BBC's Crime Watch program. Authorities offered a £20,000 reward in an attempt to garner any leads on the case, but the article which spoke about this anonymous caller gives no context or background. It is unknown if the man called, began to talk to authorities and then hung up, or if they had already spoken to him, but had more questions. Either way, it appears that the man never did get back in touch, as we have heard no further information about him. In 2014, police released several CCTV stills of two men who were walking the same route as Samuel on the night of the incident. The pair arrived at Penge East Station at 9.40 p.m. and were last seen walking towards the crime scene just minutes before the attack. According to authorities, they had released this CCTV footage before, but the men had not been identified and had not come forward. It is unclear as to whether authorities ever managed to speak with these two men or not. The most recent update in Samuel's case came in February of 2017, when law enforcement released CCTV footage of two men running past the scene of the crime on the night of the incident. The first clip, at around 9.57pm, shows two men running towards the bottom of the screen. Fifteen minutes later, the men run back in the opposite direction. Authorities have stated that the two men may not be involved, and have asked the pair that, should they recognize themselves, to please get in touch. They believe these two men may hold the key to finally solving the case. Samuel's parents, Sarah and Chris, have spoken openly about their heartache. In a 2017 interview, they said that the grief was still as raw now as it was six years ago. His death led them to, quote, start a life sentence from which we will never be released. Samuel's tragic case is still unsolved. If you have any information, you can contact the Incident Room on 020-8345-3734 or Crime Stoppers UK at 0800 555 111. 
Baby Angel. The final location in today's episode comes from our patron, Nikki Kemp, who chose the city of Winona in Minnesota. The city, which is home to around 26,000 people, is named after the legendary Native American character of the same name, who is said to have leapt to her death from a high ledge, rather than marry a man she did not love. But this strange tale isn't the only eerie thing in Winona's history. September 5th, 2011 was an ordinary day for the Forst family, who under a sunny blue sky, boated along the Mississippi River. During the trip, 14-year-old Joshua spotted a bag floating in the main channel. The group were just six miles south of Winona, near the Plamore campground, and were in a hurry, so they almost didn't stop. It was Joshua's insistence that they collect the litter before they headed home that made them turn around and fetch what they thought was carelessly dumped trash. Joshua fished the bag from the water and was shocked by its contents. Inside was the body of a seven pound newborn baby girl. She had been wrapped inside a t-shirt and a garbage bag. Joshua's family frantically attempted to revive the little girl while they contacted authorities. Sharon Forst said, she was pink when we had her. By the time dive and rescue came, she was gray. Law enforcement was in shock when they received the panicked phone call from the Forst family. They were still in disbelief when they arrived on the scene. Retired Winona County Sheriff Dave Brand was the first one to reach the family. Despite being a serving officer for 44 years, he had never seen anything like it. Telling the Winona Post, how could this be? How could somebody drop this little child in the river and not be responsible for it? Although he retired in 2015, Dave said that he still thinks about the little girl who was dubbed Baby Angel, saying, it's the one thing I wish could be resolved. The investigation began quickly. The boat patrol and dive and rescue team were called out to the scene where they combed through the river. Baby Angel had been wrapped in a men's large green t-shirt, which was stamped with the image of a slice of bread. The tan canvas bag had Manzanillo, the Mexican city, written on it in gold script. Inside the bag was what is described as an eye bracelet, which was possibly meant to ward off evil and four porcelain angel figurines. This combination of items has led authorities to speculate that baby angel's parents, or at least her mother, were religious and had sent her off in some kind of ceremony, or perhaps this was their way of showing that she was loved and they maybe felt some level of guilt for placing her in the water. According to the police, baby angel had been delivered full term without medical assistance. Her umbilical cord was still attached. She appeared to be a white female and her cause of death could not be established, although it was noted she had a fractured skull. It was determined that she had been in the water for a very short time, less than a day. According to the forced family, they had passed the same area minutes earlier, but had not seen the bag in which baby angel was found. Upon asking around, authorities found out that multiple witnesses had seen a 30 to 40 year old woman anchored nearby on a boat resembling a white sea ray with a cabin. However, this lead appears to have led nowhere. It is unknown if this woman is connected in any way to the demise of baby angel. When news of her discovery broke, the Winona Sheriff's Office received dozens of tips from people who were suspicious about pregnant friends, colleagues, and even family. Investigators compared the DNA of many women to a sample from Baby Angel, but they have yet to make a match. Eight years after the baby's discovery, authorities reported that the investigation had really slowed down. They do, however, still receive tips on occasion. They believe they just need one person with one vital piece of information to come forward before the case can be solved. Tragically, Baby Angel isn't the only infant who was found on the Mississippi River. In November of 1999, a little girl was found near Red Wing. In 2003, near Frontenac, a little boy believed to be the girl's sibling was found. Then in 2007, another little girl was found at Treasure Island Marina. These children have not been identified in the years since their discovery. With no name and no family, the local community came together to grieve for Baby Angel at her funeral in April of 2012. 
Over 150 people attended the service, where Joshua, the teenager who'd pulled her from the water, delivered a eulogy. His mother, Sharon, told media outlets that Baby Angel's mother was in an emotional crisis and needed help, saying, I think she needs that closure. If you know someone who was pregnant, now isn't and doesn't have a baby, they might be the mum who is in crisis. Baby Angel was laid to rest at Woodlawn Cemetery. It has been 10 years since she was found, but still, she goes unidentified. If you have any information on her identity, you can contact the Winona County Sheriff's Office at 507-457-6368. And there you have the facts. Thank you so much to all our Patreon supporters, and good luck to those entering into next week's Too Close to Home prize draw. Feel free to leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations relating to any of these cases, and remember to like and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.